got, I got, I got, I got loyalty, got royalty inside my DNA. I think it's time to start. So we have both a quorum and it is time. So I'm, um, hello everyone. This is PL Talk and we have a very special guest, John Regera with us today. Um, I don't know if you guys saw, but you know, as, as you might know on Twitter, I don't know how you guys know, but I, I didn't know this. John is um, not only a Utah professor, but he is a cooking enthusiast. He is a hiking enthusiast and um, he is uh, very philosophical. Um, so I, I wrote a poem for one of my tweets and then someone wrote back saying that they were, uh, their name was Fuzz. They, <laughs> um, they lived on a mountain, they're writing a cookbook and they wrote a uh, poem and they sent the poem. So I, I don't know if it's true. I, they, their name does seem to be Fuzz, but um, it, was, uh, it was very funny. And so I think that's a, that's a great uh, introduction of, of John, but we'll, we'll get back to that. But first we'll, we'll introduce our, um, our uh, live stream a little bit more. So I think also before we start, um, Hongi and I wanted to take a moment to um, just uh, say the events of the week were pretty bad. Um, and, and you, know, you might've been reading about growing anti-Asian uh, attacks in the US since COVID because of people blaming um, Chinese looking people for, for the virus. Um, you know, this is not something we, we approve of. And um, if, if you want to help, um, Hongi, you had an org that you suggested. Uh, yes, AAJC is the Asian Americans Advancing Justice. I think it's a, they uh, do legal aid and advocacy work. Um, but I think there, there are plenty of other organizations out there as well. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, I found a link with 61 organizations. So I can, I can send that. Um, but yeah, so we wanted to take some time and, uh, say, you know, if this is something you don't know very much about, it, it's worth reading about because it's something affecting a lot of people in the US right now. Um, but I think for the rest of the stream, we'll just talk about more positive things like people named Fuzz and Fuzzing. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm Jean, I'm one of the co-hosts uh, and I am the founder and CEO of a company called Akita. We do API observability. So basically like how do we understand complex systems with all their APIs and services? Fuzzing uh, was one uh, initially like the biggest part of what we did and now it's becoming increasingly smaller. But um, during that time, I got to know John very well because I asked him questions a lot about this. Um, and um, yeah, Hongi, do you want to just do a quick introduction of yourself? Can sure. Uh, yeah, I'm Hongi. I uh, am a security engineer at Figma. Uh, I have lots of fuzzy things. I have a fuzzy cat on my lap right now, but oh I also gosh. have fuzzy things in my, uh, <laughs> in my uh, background, including Sully, who is a, also the namesake of a fuzzer, as we were discussing before the stream. So, yeah. Yeah, wait, I lost my Twitch tab. Hold on. I, I was going to put something in it. <laughs> lost the tab. Um, and then uh, this is our esteemed guest. Uh, I was going to say Sir John Regeer, but I feel like you can't, you're not a fish, like you can't, you can't do that. Um, but you know, he's a, he's a big deal. Um, and uh, John, uh, John's worked on lots of stuff. Fuzzing is one of many things. And so John, it'd be actually great if you just started with, you know, an overview of, of, of your entire career, um, but very fast, very fast. Sure. Um, and, oh. Yeah, no, thanks for inviting me. And I'm really, I'm really glad you brought up the anti-Asian thing. I think that's, I think it's really important to, to, to talk about that. Um, yeah, so I'm a professor at Utah. I never kind of exactly intended to become a professor, but sort of, um, you know, it, it, it happened at some, at, at some point. So, so, so I'm here and I, I enjoy it. And, um, you know, I work on compilers and fuzzers and formal methods tools and these things. And I think, I think the main common theme across all these things is I really like to build tools. It's just really fun to make software to help us make software. It's really, uh, it's enjoyable. You can automate away. You, you know, you can you can save yourself a lot of time automating away tasks, and you can also, as everyone knows, waste a gigantic amount of time automating something that absolutely did never want it to be automated in the first place. And you know, of course, we 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 do both of these things. And um, yeah, I just I just really like to write these things, and um, it's sort of fun to do this from academia. Cause I feel like uh, possibly you know I have I have sort of a different incentive structure than people in industry have, and maybe that lets me do a little bit different kind of work. Like something like C Smith, this uh, compiler fuzzer. That uh, so I, I don't I don't want to say I wrote it because I didn't. Um, I, I worked on it with with a bunch of colleagues. Um, you know, for, for whatever reason, industry never came up with something like that for breaking compilers. And uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure why, but I you know I think it's just because it never appeared on anybody's roadmap. It wasn't uh, you know this wasn't an item that fixing writing writing this thing didn't um, stand stand in anybody's way basically. 
And so there are there are these things that don't get done by industry, and um, you know, and I, I think I think it's really sort of fun to work on these things from academia. And also, I have a very short attention span, and so um, working in academia sort of allows me to drop things relatively quickly if I get bored of them, which I which I really enjoy. Um, I, I really enjoy nothing more than dropping something once I get bored of it and just doing something else shiny. Um, and there's, and I, I really love uh, John's self intro because not only was it very fast, like we requested, but um, John talks about, you know, wanting to build tools. And I think um, John is one of my favorite academics um, uh, to, to listen to about building tools because I think that uh, John's really, really thoughtful about developer experience. And so something that um, we'll talk about today that will focus the fuzzing conversation around is the, the developer experience of fuzzing, because John has lots of thoughts around that and how, you know, fuzzing needs to be something or should be something that the developer is bought into end to end. Um, something that I had started asking John about was, hey, John, I'm running into this fuzzing developer experience thing. What are your thoughts? And I, I, I found John to be extremely resourceful on this. Um, and, and for people who, I guess, like, I, I don't know how much background to assume. So maybe, John, do you want to just give like an overview of fuzzing, an overview of why um, a lot of people say that developer experience is one of the major things holding fuzzing back? Because like when I go to fuzzing conferences, of which there, there aren't that many, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but, you know, people people keep saying DevX is something that, that you know, if, if we could just unlock that, fuzzing would be a much bigger deal. And then, um, yeah, lay it all out, your fuzzing evangelism, because I feel like John really has the, the right way of thinking about this. But there's also an alternative way that Hungi asked about just before this. And so Hungi, you should interject and like uh, ask about that during, during right. this as well. Will do. Yeah, so so fuzzing is, is this term that came from the, uh, I think the 80s where, um, and it's just Professor Barton Miller who, who the, the, the term actually comes from um, using line noise on a modem to supply input to computer programs. So that's that's the fuzz. That's the origin of it. But the idea dates back, dates back much much further. You can find almost almost all the way back to the start of computer science. People use pseudo random number generators to generate test cases, and um, or not not the start of computer science. The part of the start of computer programming. People use pseudo random number generators to generate test cases to 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 try to break their software proactively. And this goes back to you know the 50s or 60s or maybe maybe even the 40s. And um, so, so the fuzzing, the term fuzzing is relatively recent. And then the sort of explosion of fuzzing onto the sort of public scene is, is also relatively recent, but it's something that people have been doing forever. And I like to think of it as just incredibly obvious. It's sort of, it's just, it's just clearly the right way to, to, to find certain kinds of defects for, for reasons that we don't totally understand. Um, cool, John, we have a question for you from the audience unrelated to fuzzing. Uh, Pialvaro wants to know how do you just drop stuff if it's boring if you've received funding to do the work already as an academic. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's totally true. Yeah, you got to be super careful. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, funding, but, but a lot of the stuff we work on, you know, I work on some stuff that has funding, and I work on a lot of stuff that doesn't have funding. And one thing I consciously try to do is I try to hand my students things that are a little bit more thought out and more a little bit more likely to succeed. And then I try to do the stuff in my own spare time that's kind of stupid. Um, that's, that's you know not necessarily likely to succeed. I'll waste a couple of weeks on something and it doesn't pan out. I must have 50 stupid projects like this. Um, you know, and then I just drop them and you know, nobody, no, you know, I don't I don't have a time card. Nobody, nobody, I don't report to anyone really. And so I really I really enjoy this aspect. But of course you're right, the commitments to students, commitments to collaborators, commitments to funding agencies, all of these things make it make it harder. And you know, life, life intervenes, you know, I'm not. So somehow being paid just to flit around like a butterfly and, and do what I want all the time, which which would be great, but but nobody is yet. Uh, yeah, not even tenure. Not what? even tenure. You mean you mean being a professor isn't just all all fun and games like that? What? Exactly, exactly. I'm a middle manager, like 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 we all like we all end up being, or many of us end up being. Um, cool. And so, somebody asked, uh, is there somewhere to find out more about the origin of fuzzing in the name? Because that's also the first time I heard of that. Um. Yeah, have you written about this, John? Has someone else written about this? How do you know I this? I think Bart may have told me that just when I was talking to him one time, that that, that particular story. I, mm -hmm. I, I I really don't truly remember it. I'm not sure that it's written up, but the original fuzzing paper from, you know, I think it's 86 or something maybe is, uh, is, is really worth reading. And they basically just delivered line noise to a whole pile of commonly used Unix utilities. And of course, everything fell over, you know, grep fell over. Um, you know, everything that took standard in sort of fell over when delivered just random crap. And that strategy of just delivering completely random bits, you know, never stood the test of time, right? That worked because this was code written in C that had never been tested particularly aggressively, apparently. 
And you know, so so that's not how we fuzz anymore. But but this sort of or this sort of origin story for the term, I think is I think is actually really nice. And it started as a student project, um, I believe, is the story. Um, uh, some some students in in a class of Bart's were um, you know just just doing some random testing, and it sort of it sort of blossomed into this pretty cool this pretty cool and pretty influential research paper. Um, cool. And I am. I guess uh, to to not bury the lead, do you want to explain your views? I um, mean, people might have read about this, but John is very big on writing code for fuzzing, having fuzzing be part of the development process from the beginning. Do you want to just give an overview of your views on that? And yeah, I, I guess if yeah. there's a backstory, how how you came upon that? Well, the, the the I think the basic insight, and this is not something that came to me early. This is sort of I think sort of just something that maybe I thought of much later, but. It's just easier to describe. Some, sometimes it's easier to describe a class of test cases than it is to describe even a small number of individual test cases, if that makes any sense. So what you're doing when you write a, some sort of a and so here now I'm going to talk a little bit about generative fuzzers. So very broadly speaking, there are two major families of fuzzers. There's generative, where we make up test cases from 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 scratch, from whole cloth. Um, there's no input to a generative fuzzer. It's other than its source code. And then on the other hand, there's mutation-based fuzzers. These take existing test cases, some existing test corpus, and tweak it in interesting ways so that the test cases become a little bit different. The execution of the system under test kind of wanders off the beaten path a little bit, and then of course runs into trouble almost immediately all the time. And these, there's this sort of this very interesting kind of divergent philosophies of how you should fuzz. And almost all of my work has been in generative fuzzing. And most of the most influential current stuff used in industry is mutation-based fuzzing. And so what you might do is you might, for example, if you want to knock over Microsoft Word, what you would do is you'd troll the web and find just as many Microsoft Word documents as you can. And having sort of a high quality, diverse input corpus is incredibly important for that kind of work. And then you start doing bit flips or other, you know, kind of interesting, you know, man manipulations that are likely to preserve some of the structure in the Word document while kind of destroying other elements of the structure. And that, that little dance there of preserving some elements of structure while destroying other parts of it, that's what makes it work. That's where the magic is. And nobody really understands exactly what's going on here because the structure that we're talking about is often um, sort of very, very ill-defined and very vague, but, you know, but something like that is what's going on and this is, this is why it works so well. And so anyway, so the generative fuzzing is, is kind of where I mostly work. Um, I just sort of sort of enjoy it a lot. And what I often do when I write, co write code for, for my own use, or for example, I wrote a compiler for my compilers class this spring, is I fuzz it almost from the start. And yeah. so what you do is you write a program. And so a compiler, of course, is a very easy example of this. But accept, it accepts some input. And it doesn't accept very much input. It just accepts you know very simple commands at first, maybe. So you write a generator for that simple subset that it currently accepts. And um, the nice thing is, is that this kind of scales in a very clean way because um, writing the generator is usually, you know, a couple of percent of the effort of writing the thing which processes the input. Mm -hmm. And there's some sort of deep and weird things going on. They don't, it's not necessarily the case that we understand very much of this, but empirically, this is easy and it works. And, um, and what I find is this gives a very kind of sort of secure feeling to development because you can always just let this sucker run overnight. You have a compiler that's you know, maybe 500 lines of code. It doesn't do much of anything, but you have some sort of a little 50 line fuzzer. You know, maybe it's a shell script, a Perl script, an off script, but it doesn't matter. And that generates lots of inputs roughly in the current set of things that your tool, your compiler or whatever currently accepts. You know, and in the morning you see if the thing ever crashed. And if it did, you fix a couple of things. And if it didn't, then your, you know, your confidence is increased in the software. And that's the real sort of benefit is that um, you start to get a sense that the, um, you, you can start to build up a justified sense of confidence that what you wrote so far doesn't at least suck too much. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So I have a few follow-up questions. One is, um, uh, what is it that you write differently about the code itself? Cause like, I'm um, like one, like one, I guess one like naive uh, understanding of, of the same thing is like, if you're just writing the generative, uh, the, the, the generators as you go, like that seems nicer than writing the generator all at the end, but like, does it actually impact how you code? Um, but yeah, I'll just ask that one and then ask. My no, it does, it does, it does. Yeah. And it doesn't always impact it positively. So for example, for this compiler that I was writing this spring, it started causing the generated code to stack overflow. 
um, you know, you only get an eight megabyte stack or whatever on Linux. And, mm. um, you know, or no, actually, sorry, it wasn't the generated code. It was the compiler itself because my fuzzer was generating very deeply nested um, structures. Mm. And so it, what it does is it forces you to be super tight about catching error conditions and corner cases all the way from the start. Mm-hmm. Instead of getting this false sense of security that we all know and love, where you think you're wonderful and smart because nothing has crashed for a long time, but that sense of security might not be, you know, might actually be a false sense of security if, if, if it's not backed up by any actual sort of fuzzing campaign. Yeah. And like, what is, what is the difference in outcome you think of uh, testing as you go versus fuzzing as you go? Like, are these things that you would have also caught if you had just one test or you think these are just fundamentally different kinds of things that you're finding? No, I don't think they're different, but I think you find them at a different place. You find them earlier and, um, oops, sorry, I got motion sensitive lights in my office that are horrible. Um, you find, you tend to find things in a different order and it's an order that I think is good because it stops you from getting mm. too aggressive. It stops you from just piling feature upon feature. It really sort of breaks down what it, what it does is it makes you find defects quite a bit earlier um, than you might have and stops you from committing to mistakes that you might have committed to a little bit more deeply if you hadn't seen that particular test case earlier. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Do you find like th- th- this is just essentially it's an outgrowth of uh, test driven based like that sort of philosophy of development, but just that you're focused a bit more on cases where in, instead of being able to write like and be able to define all of your test cases at once, I think you were saying earlier, it's about being able to, to roughly define classes of test cases that you're, you care about. That's absolutely. So maybe like easier. Okay. No, it's very, it's very, very, I think the insights are very, very similar to test driven development. Mm-hmm. And, you, and, and you're right, you're just dealing with, with categories of test cases rather than individual ones, but otherwise it's okay. quite similar. And there's another thing that I really enjoy about fuzzing, which is that it's sort of, um, I sort of think of there sort of being kind of a, a, a trinity of, or sort of three pillars to this kind of thing. One is the fuzzer itself. Another is um, the, the test oracles. Uh, it's how do you figure out that something went wrong? And this is where, this is, this is a really fun part of fuzzing because it's incredibly, there's a lot of room for creativity. And so by default, if you pull a fuzzer off the shelf, let's take something like AFL or something, some, you know, a very capable, very useful tool. The question is, what are you looking for when you fuzz, use AFL to fuzz, you know, libping or something? You're just looking for it to crash. And looking for something to crash is fine. And we want to find the crashes because they probably stem from memory unsafeties. But that's a very crude oracle, right? That's an extremely crude thing. And there can be an awful lot of things that go wrong in, in libping with it, with, without it crashing. And so there's another piece of the puzzle here, which is incredibly important, which is as you're writing the code, you embed test oracles within the code as much as you can. And I'm here, I'm talking about things like assertions and you know, primarily assertions where, where we dynamically check for things going wrong. And the weaker the language, sort of the, the more dynamic and the weaker the language type system, you know, the more of this stuff you have to put in. If you have a sort of very tightly, you know, very um, yeah. rigid language where the, you know, one where the type system puts you in a lot of, uh, you know, forces you to jump through a lot of hoops, the fuzzer has, you know, it's, or sorry, it's not that the fuzzer has less work to do. You have less to work to do in terms of putting assertions into the code because yeah. so many things that could have gone wrong in a dynamic language can't go wrong in this more statically enforced language. Yeah, and this is related to another question I wanted to ask, which is um, the the kind of um, fuzzing workflow that you describe assumes that you have to write the generators. And I know that you, like you, you said, there's like non-generative code that's just kind of like more random. But like, what about um, co- like what about like synthesis of the generators or inference of the generators based on more structure from from your language? Like, how does that fit into the picture? That's a super interesting research angle, and it's not it's not something I've worked on, so I don't have real firsthand knowledge. But there's a steady stream of a few papers a year on essentially this topic, which is kind of inferring the structure of input that an implementation actually accepts. And then, of course, you don't want to generate exactly what it accepts because that wouldn't um, trigger any bugs. So you need mm-hmm. to generate things that are kind of like what it accepts and hope that that triggers bugs. And there's, that's super cool research and I'm not incredibly up on it, but one of the threads of that is the, so, so AFL was the sort of first really good coverage driven fuzzer. And if you go to the webpage for AFL, there's an incredibly cool demo where it essentially learns to make a JPEG or a ping or something, I forget what it is. It learns to make one of those and it learns the file format only by observing coverage of the system under test, which is the mm-hmm. library, which is, which is the parser for that file format. It's just incredibly compelling and cool. It essentially synthesizes non-trivial JPEGs, I think it is, um, for out of thin air 
only using coverage information. And I incredibly encourage people to go look at this demo because it's just a really powerful illustration of what exactly, you know, what exactly you can do with this kind of approach. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. And there have been some more questions about the relationship between fuzzing and testing in the chat. A couple of people have asked about uh, property-based testing versus fuzzing. I kind of think they're the same thing and nobody really agrees with me. Um, it's, 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 let's just say they're closely related, right? Property-based testing is something like fuzzing with um, more more test oracles or something. I don't know. I it, yeah, I, I, like yeah, I would say like property-based testing is like fuzzing with like where you can write the 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 properties, <laughs> whereas like a lot of fuzzing has like built-in properties. Sure, but I think it's like fuzzing is crazy if you don't. You know, you, you need to provide these properties anyway to to get interesting things happening, and so I, th I think it's just one of those. Yeah. So so like I say, I don't I don't find there to be much of a distinction, but but again, since other people don't agree with me, there, there's no need to kind of push on that angle. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, and so it's this sort of whole idea of um, yeah, it's, it's these these different. There's a, what I really enjoy about this is how these different pieces kind of fit together really nicely, and there's a lot of synergy between these different things and. Um, you know, and 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 again, the test oracles are incredibly important. So besides putting in, um, this is actually one of my, I, I don't have a link handy, but one of my favorite blog posts that I wrote a few years ago was about test oracles for fuzzing. And it just suggests a bunch of different things that I had heard of or seen people do in order to figure out if their code is, is working. And so I'm talking about things like if you have a pretty printer for your parser, you, um, you can parse the fuzz test case and then pretty print it. And of course you get back something different. So now you do it again. And the second time, you better get you better get the, you better get the this, the second and third things that you get better be the same as each other. They won't be the same as the first one, the original fuzzed one. But you can sort of exploit these kind of parse print loops or compress decompress loops. There's often a lot of sort of latent oracles hiding in our code, and just a small amount of thinking uncovers ways to make these synergize with fuzzers, and you get these just incredibly powerful testing loops out of this. And they're so 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 much better than just waiting for seg faults or something silly yeah. like that, which is really, yeah. honestly, not not good. I mean, it's fine if that's all we do, and some software is so bad that looking for seg faults is is, is good enough, but it doesn't get us it doesn't get us that far towards actually correct software. Yeah. So you like adapt. Yeah, yeah, that's all good. Uh, do you like change, or how do you change your approach for, uh, or do you for, um, I guess, languages with, let's say, fewer guardrails? So, languages that have you no know, type safety, for example, and do you feel like there's um, particular techniques that happen to work well there? I'm not sure I have particular techniques. I think it's just the kind of the, it just puts more onus on the testing. You, do, you just, you know, mm -hmm. if, if, if the type system is going to let you, um, you know, drop a float into a map that you thought only contained, you know, structures of something, um, you know, you just, you just have to test more because the language isn't going to stop you from doing the thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, and some, some languages stop you statically, some stop you dynamically, some just kind of let you go and do whatever you want. And it just, it just, it just means there's more burden on you as, as the, as a programmer, you get, you sort of have, you're sort of unshackled in the sense you can write anything you want. So development can yeah. be really fast, especially prototyping. And it's nice. But then, um, you know, but then, but then we get these sort of problems, and it's one of the reasons why things like uh, gradual typing are sort of, sort of so exciting. Where you could, you know, you could start with a very relaxed typing environment and just turn up, turn the screws on your on your code sort of slowly as as you feel as you feel that this helps, rather than you know um, trying to make the OCaml compiler happy at first, which I I have unbelievable battles with OCaml compilers. I just I just I spend all day and I write like lots of code, and then it turns out to be equal to like 50 lines, and I'm just like exhausted and hurt and and I hate it. Um, but I, but I, but I'm not good at it. So, so, you know, <laughs> when I was in grad school, whenever I, um, refactored code, my group mate, Rishab used to sit behind me. I was using OCaml for a while, then I was using Scala and then he would announce my type errors and how many I had to everybody in the room. And this would go on for a really long time, but, um, <laughs> this may be why I stopped using strongly statically typed languages. It was very embarrassing how many type errors I had. Yeah. No, it really is, and, and fighting, fighting, fighting the type checker. And so I, I, I've, I've written extremely little Rust, but you know, I understand that fighting the borrow checker has a little bit of this flavor. You know, you can you can beat yourself up a lot to make it happy, but once you do, you you know you know an awful lot about the code. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. cool. So some people in the chat have been asking about. Um, so James Wilcox asked, "Do you distinguish generative and mutation? You distinguish generative and mutation based, and you said you mostly do generative. But how should other people besides you decide which one to pick? Like what what aspects of the project?" That's kind of a cruel question, James. Thanks, man. 
Um, um, yeah, it's pretty situational. Like, so at the beginning of a programming effort, you probably don't have a lot of fully fledged test cases. And moreover, you probably can't deal with them if you did. So little, little throwaway generative fuzzers are incredibly easy to write. You know, often these can be 50, 60 lines of code. They're just, there's just not much to it. And so I, I, I really advocate lots of little throwaway generators. And then once the system is more up and running, I think a mutation-based approach is much more sensible. And if you look at the kind of fuzzing people do sort of, you know, on something like Microsoft Word, you know, writing a generator for fully fledged DocX or whatever, I mean, we just don't, who has the time, right? There's no good fuzzer for, there's no good generator of, of fully fledged C++ or PDF or a hundred other binary file formats that we would like to generate. There's no really strong generator that creates valid instances of these with high probability, which is what we want. We don't need, we don't, you know, we don't want hundred percent valid ones, but we'd like them the mostly to be. Yeah. So for complex artifacts, I think mutation-based is the only game in town, but for simple things, and, and at the beginning, you really want the generative one because now you have complete control and you're not you sort of, first of all, you don't need test cases, but second of all, you know, you, you wouldn't want to write those simple test cases anyway. They're just, because they're, they're just sort of silly. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I am. think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you have a, when you have a rich corpus anyway, like there's not, you know, you're not investing that much work anyways to generate your test cases. Yeah, exactly. But for example, let, let me take an example where um, when we were doing CSmith, so this is a, a fuzzer, it, a random C program generator. There was at the time we started this an extremely rich corpus of C programs out there. And we could have used them, except we couldn't because they all either had undefined behavior in them or would have, uh, or, you know, or, or would have after, after we mutated them. And so mm -hmm. we, we really needed to enforce a very strong property on the test cases that we wanted to generate. And there really was no way to enforce this for, for existing test cases. Um, someone named undefined behavior in the chat said, hello, did I hear my name? <laughs> <laughs> my, other, um, my other favorite topic. Yeah, yes. so some, someone in the chat asked, why don't we have these generators? Are they really hard to write? Like why, like John, why aren't people write, like programming with generators? What, what's stopping us? Then? Sure, they, they are truly really hard to write. Like let's say you want, a gen, you want a generator that has a non-zero probability of generating any valid, let's see. You want to generate an expressive C++ generator, but you don't want it to generate invalid things. Because if you, if you want to be able to, in principle, generate every C++ program, you just generate random bit strings. The problem is, is that the problem, the fraction of random bit strings that are valid C++ is, you know, very, very, very near zero. So in practice, that doesn't work. So we need to impose structure and something like C++ is probably one of the most, sorry, valid C++ is probably one of the most difficult file formats known to known to man or known to people. Um, Full PDF would be like this. Um, full, uh, yeah. maybe some sort of motion movie format. These are very. It's a lot of engineering, and I think people. We, I think we just don't have the stomach for it. And since we can get a lot of the benefit from mutation, we just. It's probably not really necessary. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And this is also related to another question I wanted to talk about with you, which is what things should be fuzzed and what things does it really not matter to fuzz? Yeah. So that's interesting. So. One, there's, there's a really strong implicit bias out there in the world, which is we're fuzzing for security. Yeah. And that's, it's because security bugs are so incredibly painful and also because due to the sort of accident of C happening, there are so many uh, in, unsafe, you know, in unsafe languages. And so, so, so um, that's kind of where fuzzing kind of entered into the really, uh, pu the public mind, I suppose is because the security implications of it are so incredibly um, important. But really, um, so if we look, if we talk about fuzzing just in the sense of random testing, you know, everything should be randomly tested. I, I can't think of anything I've written, you know, other than throwaway stuff that, that, I, that I wouldn't randomly test. You know, throwaway yeah. stuff, of course, you know, shell scripts, you can't randomly test them because their behavior depends so strongly on a file system configuration, yeah. not on an mm -hmm. input, a, a well-defined input. So, you know, nobody has time to generate random file system configurations and moreover, I know the shell scripts I write suck, and I know they're mostly latent collections of crashes and crappy things, um, and that's fine, right? I'm just going to run them a few times, and if they if they mess up, um, I, I could care less. I'll fix it. But anything that is going to be exposed to other people very much, you know, basically everything should be randomly tested. There's no there's no reason not to do it because it's so easy. Yeah. So yeah. what's the ideal workflow for um, with fuzzing involved for both a 
a project that you start from scratch and a project that is a mess that you found like on the floor somewhere. Sure. So from, in the, from scratch, like I, I, th I think it's pretty much what I've been saying all along. You know, you write little generators as you're writing the thing, and you know, if you if you need to throw some of them away because they they don't scale or their approach is poor, then you throw them away, and may, you know maybe they outlast their their usefulness anyway. So what's probably from scratch sort of sort of comes along with a little pile of fuzzers, and um, you know some of them survive, some don't, but they all kind of do their do their little job contributing. And then yeah, if you have, if you find a project out in the wild, you probably you know, the, the question is, what are you trying to do with it? You know, like, like one thing I would not, one thing I don't do is reuse. Well, so here's the thing I want, I wanted to, one time I was doing a software engineering class and I wanted to show people how to fuzz something like a data structure implementation. So I had them find red black trees from the internet and yeah, and start fuzzing them. And it turned out that most of them were so wrong that they couldn't even be fuzz sensible. They weren't even, they, you know, you don't want to fuzz things until they What like, an insult, you can't even be fuzz. No, they can't be. They couldn't be fuzzed effectively because they weren't even remotely close to correct. And so there's a very real thing where some projects have enough bugs in them that are known that there's absolutely no point fuzzing, right? Um, where the developers just have no bandwidth for this because mm -hmm. they already know about bugs and they're and they're busy with them or they're busy doing something else. And so those yeah. are the things we shouldn't fuzz. Are where mm -hmm. the quality just isn't at the point where this this makes any sense. Yeah, there's a minimum maturity level. Essentially, there's a minimum maturity level. But yeah. this is also one of the reasons why generators are so nice because the generator could be really friendly, right? It could, it could, yeah. you know, it doesn't have to do that much. It doesn't have to generate 85 megabyte ping images or whatever. It can just generate ones that are really friendly and happy and live in a very safe space. Yeah. And, you know, and we're just, we're just, we're just making sure we don't regress. Yeah. Whereas the mutation based fuzzer is like a fire hose where it's the same, ho same fire hose for everyone, but you don't really get very much. It's much harder control. to get control. It's much yeah. harder to control yeah. what you're getting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. And so now there's an audience question about what's what's the relationship between fuzzing and formal verification. And I know you have some really cool thoughts about that. So maybe this is <laughs> a, the right time to talk about all of the thoughts. Yeah. So that's very deep and fun. And I think the way I think of it is so formal verification is where you're saying is some property true for all inputs for for all configuration for all input configurations is some property true of my software. Like I might ask does my C compiler, um, you know, emit, well, let's not talk about C compilers. Does my ping library crack, dereference a null pointer for any conceivable input, you know, all the way from zero bytes to, to infinity bytes? And formal verification lets us answer that question. Fuzzing is just a weak version of that, which lets us ask, does it crash for some things? So it's like, it's like an approx, formal verification has this big quantifier, this big for all quantifier. Uh, we quantify over all possible inputs. Fuzzer, fuzzing is just an approximation of that, and yeah. it's not a very large approximation. In fact, you know, in a in a in a sense of how much of the space of inputs you're exploring, it's always zero. It's always exactly not exactly zero, but so close as as to not as to not matter. But we find lots of bugs anyway, and that's sort of the the sort of weird thing. But so so there's a very real sense in which you'd be foolish to try to formally verify something before fuzzing it. And this is something that I think the formal verification community really got wrong for a very long time and now completely understands, which is that if you try to, most things are mostly wrong. And if you start trying to prove them correct, you just can't, right? They're, they're just yeah. mostly wrong. So, you know, so, so that's, so that's, so that's silly. And so what you want to do is you fuzz them until you're absolutely certain that you can't find anything more by fuzzing, you know, and only then would formal verification make any sense. And moreover, when you fuzz, you put in a lot of assertions and stuff, and you've basically evolved a very partial specification for your system. And you've covered a lot of corner cases that verification would cover. So you're you're basically, you know, not 80% of the way there, but you're maybe 20% of the way there when yeah. you finish, finished a fuzzing campaign. It almost it sounds like you're sort of describing the an evolutionary process for writing a program almost where you start with something that's really terribly wrong. It's not even worth fuzzing because you already know where a lot of the bugs are. Then you get to a point where uh, you could formally verify it, but it's not really worth it until you go and fuss things quite a bit until you use that to that strategy to iron out the bugs. And then it might be worth actually investing the effort to uh, do some analysis. No, that's absolutely the case. And let's be honest, yeah. most things aren't ever worth formally verifying, right? Most things it's, it's just, yeah. it's just not, it's just not in the cards for a lot of software, but you know, but when it is, um, you know, you fuzz first and this, this gives you the, or this gives you the, the, you know, it gives you a, an excuse to write a good part of the specification that you needed mm -hmm. to write anyway for, for the, for the verification part. Um, cool. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, hmm, yeah, 
there are a bunch of questions from the chat. How long should we answer? Yeah. Should we ask some of them? Sure. Uh, let's see if we go backwards a little bit. Um, there are a couple of questions about. Uh, Let's see. Uh, ah, there's one person asked, has anyone had success using reinforcement learning for fuzzing? And uh, if someone else also asked, uh, why do you think uh, property testing tools aren't used more in industry? Oh, I mean, this is yeah, part of a bigger question. Why isn't fuzzing yeah. more popular? <laughs> we should, we should <laughs> yeah, exactly. Talk about this. Which is also related. What can we do to yeah, make uh, like, fuzzing easier? What can compilers and other tools do? So yeah, yeah. There's there. a related uh, big set of questions around developer experience of these tools. Yeah. Yeah. So this is one of the things that I'm so I'm sometimes slow about these things, but it took me a very long time to learn that almost everything I do is about people. You know, I like to think it's about tools and software because software is fun and stuff, but it's all about making things better for people. And I think there's been some unbelievably positive trends, for example, in programming languages in the last maybe 10 years, that you can see this incredibly increased focus on error messages and on interactive comp compilers and on environments that work with you. With They work with the way that you want to work with code, as opposed to some sort of a 50s batch mentality where the compiler hits an error and keeps on going until it's filled your screen with 5,000 errors and it's just a bunch of crap you can't possibly wade through. You know, and the, the, there's just been this incredibly positive, these incredibly positive trends towards productive developer productivity. And I think they've been, they've been necessary because the software has gotten so big. And, you know, all these things like refactoring tools, all these incredible tools that we get are just, you know, it's, it's what we use to keep up, just to keep up with the pace of development and with the size of, of modern software, which is, you know, horrific you know it's just it, it would appall someone from 1985 or whatever so um so yeah so so there's this whole user facing side for fuzzing and this is the reason i think afl one you know was 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 such an incredibly game changing tool is that you have a unix binary or not sorry not a unix binary you have a, a c++ code base and you compile it using afl gcc and you run this one command and suddenly it's popping out seg faults and yeah. It's got this nice ASCII art screen and it shows you fun things with lots of little metrics that are increasing and decreasing. And you know, it's it's super, super fun. It's just, it's just incredibly entertaining to use, at least if you're the type of person entertained by <laughs> by this sort of thing, which which obviously I am and many I, I suspect many of the rest of you are. Um so that kind of user experience is absolutely a win and you know, really um is really unbelievably powerful and and and, and good. And there had been some previous fuzzing frameworks that People talked about well, but I, you know, often I often I ran out of steam before I actually got a, a bug out of any of yeah. them. And so it's just one of these things where you know it just takes sort of thoughtful people packaging things up, and you know there 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 are these natural sweet spots that things kind of hit eventually, and you know there's still a lot of things that you can't fuzz, and it's fine I guess you know when you know we'll, we'll get there though. Um, John, what about yeah. the back end of fuzzing? Because you click a button and then you get like a thousand errors. Um, something Hong Yi and I have talked a lot about is how do you how do you prioritize the errors? How do you yeah. communicate to developers what it meant? Um, and something right. you and I have talked about, John, was what about confidence? Because you know, like, what if like what if your results are actually flaky? What is an error? How do you convey like how many times you saw something? Yeah, like what like what do you see as some of the some of the bigger problems on the on the developer experience of the back end now? And and do you have thoughts about how we can solve them? Yeah, prioritization is one of the real problems with fuzzing, right? You you almost have to commit to fixing everything that comes out because, you know, and right, right, yeah, every, everybody grimaces, the whole audience grimaced because, because it's so hard to sort of filter. And you can do a lot of things though, like you can, once you identify, if you can come up with a signature for a particular error, like, um, you know, it's a seg fault in this function, you can filter those. And so there are ways to sort of triage things and stuff, but prioritization remains incredibly hard. And one of the things that I really, really um, like to harp on is, is, and and so far we have only very, very partial success of this. It's it's test case reduction and canonical, canonicalization, where you take a test case that triggers a bug in the system under test, and you want to convert it to the smallest possible test case that triggers the same failure, and ideally you'd also you'd also canonicalize it. Ideally, you would you would have a tool that could convert every test case that triggered that failure into the same minimized canonicalized yeah. test. And that's impossible, but you know, it's a good goal. But that kind of thing can go an enormous way towards, um, towards uh, the triaging problem. If you can give people a really minimal trigger for a bug, uh, most many developers seeing this minimal trigger for a bug can actually sort of envision what must have failed. 
they, they just sort of know. Um, you know, and they know, they, and they, they can often tell it sort of at a glance if it's particularly severe. One of the GCC developers was pretty awesome. Uh, I gave him a, some sort of bug that triggered a GCC bug and, and he uh, rewrote it into a Fortran test case that triggered the same bug. I've always, I've always admired that. I always thought, I've always thought that was one of the single most cool little technological feats that I've ever seen somebody do that just, just be able to take this test case, you know, and he could, because he knew what internal yeah. representation was, was, was tickling the bug and he made Fortran that did the same thing. I was, I was, I always yeah. thought that I always thought that was extremely impressive. That's super cool. Is this the right segue for your C reduce demo, John? Sure, let's just do a little C reduce demo. So, so, so yeah, so, so I had this, or my group had this project CSmith, which, um, which was finding a lot of C compiler bugs, and these the bug triggers. That is to say, the random programs that made the compiler do the wrong thing were sort of um, horrifically long. And so, the natural thing to do, and this is this is something that people have known how to do for 50, 60 years, is you delete part of the test case. And if that still triggers the bug, then you delete more of it. And if it doesn't trigger the bug anymore, you put it back. And that process can be automated. And this, this, this professor Zeller, Andreas Zeller, sort of noticed this in the 90s uh, around the turn of the millennium and called this delta debugging. And delta debugging is sort of this sort of subsetting thing. And I really sort of quickly realized that when we were finding compiler bugs, we needed a tool like that. So I started working on one and I worked on it for just sort of years and years and, and eventually kind of made it into sort of a, a pretty powerful tool for making programs smaller. And the, the sort of fun thing about this tool is that it doesn't so much um, only subset the code. It actually has meaningful transformations. Like it'll inline a function, it'll devirtualize, it'll remove a function argument. Uh, from not only a function, but from all the call sites. So it has a huge bag of tricks not found in, that, that you can't find without some domain knowledge. And so let's just sort of show an example here. So let's see. Okay, so here I have a random um, source file. It is uh, server.i. It is the pre-processed version of one of the files that goes into Redis. So it's the Redis server pre-processed. It's half a megabyte. And so let's just sort of... Um, Let's, so let's compile it and see what happens. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for um, uses of the XMM register in the assembly. OK, so in the, X, in, in the assembly, we can see we have this uh, uh, floating point conversion instruction. And so what, what we're going to do now is I'm not going to demonstrate reducing a test case with respect to a compiler bug. What I'm going to say is, let's say we wanted to ask a different question. What if we just had no idea what circumstances cause a C compiler to emit this particular instruction that I've highlighted? So we want to find the smallest program that causes Clang to emit um, this, this convert SS to, 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 to SD uh, instruction. And you know, we might reasonably want, want to do this because we want to understand something about the Clang backend. So it's, a, so it's sort of a reasonable, uh, it's a reasonable thing to, to want to do maybe. OK, so, so we're going to do that instruction. So um, let's see, let me. Uh... So what we do is we have to tell CReduce how, we have to tell CReduce what we're looking for. So we're going to make a little shell script, and we're going to run clang uh, on server.i. We don't want to hear about warnings. We need to optimize. We need to go to assembly, and we're going to pipe through, and we're going to grep it for this, the name of this instruction. And this, this, this already works. We're already done telling C reduce what's interesting. So if the server.i file gets compiled to something containing this instruction, this shell script, because of grep, will return zero. Otherwise, it'll return one. So if either the compiler fails or the assembler, the assembled output, the, the assembly language output doesn't contain this instruction, the thing will return a non-zero exit code. And it's all C reduced needs. So I got to make it executable. And then we can say, we can, now we can just reduce this. So we can, so we, we tell C reduce um, about, we, we, we tell it what our interestingness criterion is. It's that shell script returning zero. And we give it the pro and we give it the input, the half megabyte of pre-processed C code, and we can just let it go. Oh no, what did I do? Mm. Oh no. I should always do this thing first. So you run the thing and then you look at its return code. Now, what did I do? Oh, I'm sorry. I did not, I did not tell the output to standard out. There we go. Okay. Mm. You should always, you always, always, always. Um, okay, and so now what Cerutus is doing is it's trying a lot of different things. So it's, it has a whole bunch of strategies for removing parts of the program. 
And it starts slow, but it's going to fairly quickly get pretty far. You can see it's already well over 90% into the test case. So it tracks the number of bytes left. And because we have a fairly simple thing we're looking for, that is to say C code, which generates this particular instruction, hopefully it'll converge fairly quickly here. Um, I, didn't, I didn't check this particular thing, but usually it does. And so again, it's got a lot of sort of different strategies that it's trying. Um, and they're all ways to simplify the test case. And it's got a fair amount of canonicalization logic in it too. Like it'll rename functions, rename variables. It uh, sorts things um, in certain ways. So it's trying, it's, it's, it's sort of a very weak attempt for this goal of taking all programs um, that trigger this particular behavior and reducing them to the same thing. And so again, that's impossible, but that would be something very powerful and very cool to work on. Okay, there we go. So that's a reduced test case. So it is, um, we have an integer value A and we convert it to a float and that makes Clang emit that instruction and C reduce can't make, um, can't think of a smaller way to do that. So does that mean there isn't a smaller way to do that? Of course there is. It just couldn't be reached using a greedy direct search from 500, ki 500 kilobytes of um, um, pre-processed C code from this random um, Redis file that I, that I happened to have sitting around when I, when I started doing this. So that's what C reduce does. And if that had been a program which crashed Clang or GCC or whatever, then it would have come up with, a, the, you know, with its idea of the minimal test case triggering that. And, and again, I think this is incredibly critical. We could not have done this work reporting. So I, I, I sort of my, my own self reported like 500 compiler bugs. That would have been just completely impossible uh, without, without this tool. So I essentially was forced to write it just to, um, just to uh, just to do this project. And since we're here, and since I make so much money on every copy of C reduce that everybody downloads, I'm gonna plug it a little more. It also reduces other languages pretty well too. It, it, it reduces, um, you know, it reduces Rust, Java. I've used it on a, a dozen or two programming languages and it's special purpose logic for like inlining a function won't work, but it doesn't get in the way that much either. So it, it sort of works for some languages. Um, it really works well for C-ish things. And it works great for C and C++. Um, John, could you just summarize the insight that makes it work across languages? Yeah, I don't understand. I think it's just because <laughs> Algol and Lisp, you know, there's just this incredible shared heritage of, of there's, there's this incredible shared syntactical heritage that we have across our language. I, I think that's all it is. The, the block structured programming languages with, you know, and CWIT mm. understands curly braces, angle braces, square braces. It understands them all uh, at, at some rudimentary level, I mean. And so, you know, whatever combination of those they use, uh, it works pretty well. And it's also got a tokenization pass based on a C tokenizer. But if you run a C tokenizer on Rust or Java or anything else, you know, you don't, you, you don't tokenize it correctly, but you don't tokenize it incredibly badly either. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. So, someone wants to know about SMT lib files and someone wants to know about JITs for C reduce. Yes. So it works fine for SMT lib. Um, I've done it, it you know, it, or, or at least pretty okay. Somebody has a SMT lib reducer that's separate, which may work a lot better. Um, certainly CReduce has not been remotely optimized for that, but it, but it would work. And if it doesn't work, so CReduce is, it's sort of this, so, so you know how compilers are like a pluggable architecture inside where they're, they're modular? Well, CReduce is like that too. The, it plugs in a lot of reduction passes and nobody's really done it yet, but it would totally be possible to hack it so that if it detects an SMT lib file, it just swaps, it just deletes a bunch of passes from its pass schedule that are uh, C specific and adds a bunch of SMT lib specific ones. So C reduce tends to work really badly on things like LLVM intermediate representation mm -hmm. because it has this incredible cross -reference stru referencing structure with numbering of SSA values. That makes it super hard to reduce um, textual LLVM IR. And C reduce also works incredibly badly on binary formats. Like if you try to reduce a JPEG or something, it's just not going to go because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very hard coded for something kind of Algol or Lisp-like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. Uh, someone asks, well, it sounds like we can write C reduce plugins potentially for other languages. Um, someone asks, could C reduce benefit from type information? Yeah, um, it, tr it does some of that already in the sense it'll do a coordinated replacement of types sometimes, um, mm -hmm. but you know, so, so let's think about what you're trying to do with something like C-Reduce. There's a fundamentally a guessing aspect to it because you don't know what is going to make the bug go away when you delete it. So what you're really trying to do is just generate something that is also syntactically valid. It, ha it should be smaller or at least simpler in some fashion. And you want to at least have a pretty good chance that it triggers the bug still. 
So those are sort of the collection of requirements and it only has to meet them probabilistically, even if each individual thing it tries only works 1% of the time, which is probably about what, what it is, uh, you still you can still get good results. So type information, you just, you just wanna, res you, you wanna respect the, the constraints of the format you're reducing is, 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 is the issue. And so if you have a very, very tightly typed language like Rust or, or OCaml, uh, it's quite a lot tougher to make sort of random blind changes. Mm -hmm. And then you might need something like an OCaml parser and even OCaml type checker, and then do the reduction operations on the, some, some AST for that language and then pretty print it back out. Something like that might work a lot better for a very restricted file format. Gotcha. Well, cool. yeah, thank you, John. So uh, we have about eight minutes left. I feel like we should come away with like what stands between like where we are now and like more usable fuzzing or, you know, more people doing automated testing or I don't know if Hongi has more specific versions of these questions, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like what I would ask is, you know, why do you don't, do you think people aren't using it more? Um, certainly, it, like it's obviously a lot harder once you already have a large complex program and you all of a sudden decide, oh, maybe fuzzy might be a good idea now. Um, your options are a bit more limited. But yeah, I think just in general, why do you think uh, it's not nearly as popular as perhaps it should be? Yeah, well, um, for one thing, I think it is approaching its appropriate right. degree of popularity. You know, five years ago, no, but but you know, but now you know, fuzzing is pretty pretty mainstream. Um, you know, I think, I think it's just a lot of, we just have a lot of constraints, you know, a lot of people are just busy, right? You know, we're just, we're just, yeah. we're just trying to stay afloat here and, and sell a product or do something. And, you know, do we really want like 100,000 more bugs or, or 100 more bugs or what, you know, do we really want to know about them? Or if they're not impacting our customers yet, maybe we just actually don't, don't know. You don't yeah, want to well, because one thing you said, John, that really struck me was you have to commit to fixing all the bugs. And I think that maybe yeah. we can like relax that. <laughs> like, do you have thoughts about, yeah. can we relax that uh, constraint? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff you can do. So filtering, so you can use gentler generators if you have a generative fuzzer. That's, that's a very good strategy. You can, you, you can use generators that like, let's say that we never want to see a crash caused by an input bigger than a kilobyte. So you just don't generate them. So that's easy, right? Mm. But, but John, here's a, like a contradiction though. You also said that in like large complex systems, we shouldn't use generators. So how do we get out of this contradiction? Ah, uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, um, no, it's hard, it's hard. And there's a lot of systems that are non-deterministic, right? Because they have more moving parts than, than you can isolate on one machine. Um, there's a lot of systems where you might not even be able to, you might not even have a test instance at all, right? You might just have the production one and it might be sort of mm -hmm. physically impossible to fuzz it or something. There's a lot of sort of individual circumstances where it can't be done. Um, yeah, there's a lot of work left to do on the triage side yeah. where problems come out and we need to, we need to eliminate the ones that we don't want to see right now somehow, or also try to identify the ones that might be impacting customers that we just haven't heard about. So like yeah. one of the reasons I worked on compiler crashes and compiler miscompilations is I have the hypothesis that the vast majority of those go unreported because yeah. you know, what do you do when your compiler crashes? You start messing with stuff until it doesn't crash and you've forget about that hour of your day, right? Yeah. You no, know, you probably don't report it. Um, you know, and, and miscompilations are even worse. The system doesn't work. You don't even know it's a miscompilation, right? Oh yeah. It's probably an application error and you start messing with stuff anyway. And maybe you, now you stop, mis mis stop triggering the miscompilation. And so like, you know, your, your life goes on. And mm -hmm. so I had the idea that there's this sort of, you know, submerged part of the iceberg of compiler bugs hindering development. And this mm -hmm. is especially true for like embedded systems where, yeah. um, the compilers yeah. honestly suck. Uh, you know, you know, GCC and LLVM are are you know incredibly good compared to most embedded tool chains. And uh, you know, my my hypothesis was is that giving people tools for finding these was a really good idea. But again, like you say, um, if you really put a fine point on it and say, does this bug found by a fuzzer impact customers? You know, that can be very very hard, right? And you know, if it's obviously a security vulnerability, now you have to fix it. Yeah. If it's yeah. Uh, if it's clearly um, something that people have complained about in other forms, maybe the fuzzer test case is just smaller and easier to fix. Now we fix it too. But in the vast majority of cases, it's not obviously clear that's the best use of our day. Yeah. And so it sort of takes kind of, you know, really aggressive testing minded people. And I'm convinced that this is some sort of a, you know, personality trait or something, this, this sort of, you know, fanatical desire to smash software and, and fix it all. And not everybody, feels that way, right? And it's not clear that that's, everybody should feel that way. 
So I have another hypothesis, which is that most fuzzing has sort of been trying to approximate static analysis, but like fuzzing is actually a dynamic technique. And if we like, like actually I'm like focus fuzzing on hot pads and common pads, like this could be like really, really fruitful, but not really many people are doing it. Like this is what we were doing at Akita when we were building a fuzzer. We were like, well, like we actually don't want all the pads. And like one reason, like all of like the, like most of the bad parts of fuzzer is like the fact that they have to run for very long. The fact that they report all these bugs that no one cares about. The fact that like you can't prioritize bugs. Like I think that like, I don't know, one, one weakness seemed to me that people are like, people are treating fuzzers like just like, you know, static checking light, but like people don't want <laughs> static checking a lot of the times they want dynamic checking. Sure. So I'm, um, mm -hmm. yeah, like I, I feel like for fuzzing to actually become really useful, like one of my views is like, like actually embrace the, the, the dynamism of it. I think so. And, and this, this kind of fuzzing on the hot path is, you know, but it's, of course it's a tension, right? Like maybe it's not the hot path errors that are burning your customers, right? Like, you know, it's yeah, just, yeah. yeah. It just depends on what they're doing. Are we talking about the, the production instance or are we talking about, or are we concerned about error cases where somebody adversarial may knock our system over, in which case yeah. we need to absolutely stay off. Yeah. Of yeah. And I, and I actually think that like the like dream is really to combine some kind of like generator free approach with generators that like that, like not generators, but some kind of like DSL that lets you specify what you care about. Like, is it hot paths? Is it adversarial behavior? Like, like kind of like project out a subset of what you actually care about to, to like your fuzzing algorithm. So I think like that's when we can truly take advantage of being dynamic. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, I don't, I don't know that we're really all that close to what you said, but <laughs> I don't, I don't think anybody's really working on this, but I, yeah. I just, it's just very clear to me that I think this is the future. <laughs> yeah. But how do you encode pro information about your program and all of that? I think yeah, that's the very, I mean, really I mean, tricky part. Essentially what we did was we were like, all right, people care about data leaks. And so we just like implicitly encoded it into our fuzzing algorithm. But like, I, I feel yeah. like if I were like in academia working on this, I would, I would like have like make it like parametric with respect to like what, whatever the like the fussing uh, algorithm is. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah. for anyone out there listening, please work on this. I think this is the future. <laughs> and there's such um, cool, there's such incredibly cool, you know, results coming out of fuzzing, both from industry and from academia. I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't even keep up with it hardly, but you know, yeah. I, read, I read papers that, that all every month there's really cool. Yeah, stuff yeah, no, there's a lot of really cool new stuff. I, I agree. Yeah, there's many futures, but I mean, this is a missing part of the future. I haven't seen anybody work on. Um, Cool. So we have um, one official minute left. Um, yeah. John, is there anything you would like to leave people with? Like, how can we, you know, what, what future should we all be building towards? What yeah. should we be doing? Yeah. What should we do? What are some <laughs> takeaways we should, if we want to, well, if we're mad at the internet and we want to fix things. Sure. No, I think it's these, I think it's all the things we've been saying, you know, use, use modern languages. You know, we, we all, we all, we all know this stuff. Use, use good languages, test, test, test like crazy. And you know, it doesn't have to be fuzzing, you know, it's just, you just, you know, we, we should all, we all know we should write more test cases, but we often don't because we're just, you know, just not what we wanted to do in the morning and we have to get, we have to get something working. Right. And, um, you know, just, just sort of, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I think just sort of a careful, a thoughtful approach to all this is, is, is really, really goes a long ways. Yeah. I feel like this is like my parents being like, Gene, just be nice brush your teeth, eat your vegetables. <laughs> I know. And this is what I sound like to students. I'm always just like beating on these things and I can just see them looking at me just like, why is this old person saying? Um, but yeah, no, I think <laughs> someone, someone wants you to list the good languages and the bad ones. Maybe oh, we're out no. of time. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> Maybe we're out of time for that one. <laughs> oh, I still write a lot of Perl, so I'm the last. That's, everyone's been saying this yeah. all chat about your Perl, John. Take. There's a, there's a lot, there's a lot of, I um, <laughs> Yeah. I guess I'll have to go to the, uh, I don't have the, uh, I don't have the Twitch app. I'll, I'll have to go after, I'll have to go look at it. Yeah. I think people in the discord, I don't know if, I don't know if you're in the discord, but if someone wants to put a link to the discord in the, in the Twitch, um, yes. if you can, I think John's in there somewhere. I am, I am on the discord, but <laughs> you can I, I, talk I was... to him about his usage of Perl. Um, yes. Yeah. Because yeah, the Twitch, like... unfortunately stream won't stay up or the yeah. chat will, will... Un Unpopular take Perl is just Python with dollar signs. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, that's actually uh, true. And let, not strict about white space. No, every time I try to learn Python, all I realize is that it's, I'm just writing the same thing I write in Perl, but like three times longer. Yeah, without dollar signs. I feel like code is just fancier with dollar signs. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, cool. Well, thank you so much, John. This was I'm extremely popular. People had many, many feelings and thoughts about everything you had to say, which is great. Um, there's a Discord. Um, uh, could somebody also post a link to our uh, PL Talk schedule? Because um, next week, Satnam, who is 
in the chat, I think he was in the chat, is was. Yes. Um, yep. Not next week, actually. Next week, we have a week off. So you can use that time to reflect on what is a good language, what is a bad language. I think it's the correct time to start a Discord war, for instance. Um, you have Sat 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 Satnam Singh? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. He's going to come on. Hey, Satnam. Um, hey, Satnam, yeah. Second April. Um, to talk about the Kava project. So um, I might just be making this up because I haven't really looked into it yet. Um, but it's something, something, hardware verification with cock, something, something, root of trust, something. Um, I think, yeah, Satnam, please correct me. Um, he says yes. <laughs> okay, cool. I got it right. Um, and then uh, April 9th, we have a couple of people from the TypeScript team to talk about compiling TypeScript, which will be fun. Um, then at some point, uh, then we have an empty spot from where Satnam was supposed to present. So we'll figure something out to do that day. Um, maybe Hongi and I will finally do something that we said we would yeah. do. <laughs> we'll have to discuss between the two of us. Yeah. And then maybe um, we should have you talk about what Akita does. Oh yeah, we can we do that talking too. about it. That's true. I will. I you know we can just like, yeah. We'll just keep it kind of like um once. Once Hongi does his like live coding, and once I talk about a keynote, oh, yeah. it's not the yeah. end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's um, right. Yeah. And then April 23rd, um, we have uh, Dr. Neha Rangta from Amazon AWS talking about Zalkova, which is one of the public um, triumphs of uh, using SMT solvers to do something. Um, yeah, so someone wants a WebAssembly. I think WebAssembly is very popular. That sounds great. Well, people, people are always saying something, something WebAssembly. In fact, I've had students try to work with me on WebAssembly, but I'm like, I don't know anything about this, so you cannot work with me on this. <laughs> um, I can say that Figma is a big user of WebAssembly, so it's definitely interesting. Maybe this is your live coding, Hongi. Maybe we can have oh, a no. WebAssembly <laughs> off. The great WebAssembly <laughs> off. Um, yeah, cool. So I think, you know, there have been also like lots of nominations and self nominations. So please keep them coming. Um, Hungy, I have to review them with you at some point. That's good. Um, we have we have a lot. We have some reviewing to do. Yeah. Um, cool. So everyone uh, enjoy the week off next week. It is, you know, um, people can plan a spontaneous uh, discord war during this time if you wish to do so. And then, um, yeah, uh, everyone, let's thank John again. This was an awesome episode. Thank, thanks, Don. I super appreciate the invitation. Yeah, thank you so much. It was very hard to get John. It took us months and months and like <laughs> multiple requests from multiple people. So this was, um, you know, we can't, we can't accidentally lose the tape from this one. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, all right, goodbye everyone. See you in two weeks.